<laughs> Welcome to Breakthrough the Ordinary Podcast. We are committed to empowering and bringing you effective tools and wisdom to live your extraordinary life here and now through impactful conversations with thought leaders, trainers, coaches, and healers. By trusting yourself, we believe you can generate your goals and desires. Your hosts are the sibling duo, Claudine and Mark Schermonte. Right here, right here. So today we have an amazing man. Uh, I consider him amazing. He's part of my family, and his name is Michael DeSanter. He's the author of New Man Emerging. He's a transformational specialist and an owner of Authentic Self Healing, He's a, which is a fulfillment company uh, for professionals. His latest endeavor is Find Your Tribe, an online coaching course for men who are committed to living their lives at their full potential. Mike's life mission is to inspire men and women to live lives of purpose, meaning, and fulfillment. You can connect with him at www.michaeldesanti.com. That's M-I-C-H-A-E-L-D-E-S-A-N-T-I.com. Love having you here. Welcome. Uh, I appreciate being here. It's great to always spend time with you guys. Yes, same here. Same here. Small world. Yeah. Yeah. So, Michael, one, we, uh, we know you're an author. We brought your book. Okay. Yes, we We've do. New Man we Emerging. It. Both of us have, have read the book. Wonderful. Um, and I love that you have these uh, exercises to ground the messaging at the end of each book. I mean, you know, it's about exactly. embodiment, yeah. right? And one of the questions that I had was if you could differentiate fulfillment and success. And I think they often get confused in our society and how we measure them and experience them. So I'm uh, just curious. Absolutely. I I think the most important initial piece is to distinguish what I call domains. Domains are, are areas in life that require love and attention. So your health is a domain, your family, your relationships, your, uh, your finances, your career, your leisure life, your spiritual life. These are all domains. They require love and attention. And for, uh, success, to distinguish success, success is an achievement in a particular domain of life. So it's, I've achieved something in my health or in my career and finances. I've achieved something. I've accomplished something in a specific domain in life. Fulfillment, the way I distinguish fulfillment is that where all of my domains in life receive the appropriate amount of love and attention so that my health gets the appropriate amount of love and attention. My career and finances get the, gets the appropriate amount of love and attention. My marriage gets the appropriate amount of love and attention. Health, my uh, leisure life, the things I love doing, my hobbies, my passions, that they all get the appropriate amount of love and attention. And I use the word appropriate deliberately because I don't think they can all be equal. There are certain seasons of life where your career requires more love and attention than your leisure life does. There's seasons in life where your marriage requires more love and attention than your career or your finances. So appropriate means that I give love and attention to all of those domains at the capacity in which that cup is filled up in that season. Hmm. How, did, how does someone distinguish that, right? So, you know, how do you assist people to really say like, how do I prioritize, right? They all get to be fed. I'm hearing that, but there's times when there's m more, I'll use that word, you know, given to a special area. So how do, how do people help distinguish I, that? One of the, the things I do with all of my clients actually initially up front is what I call an honest audit that we actually distinguish and separate all of these domains and which ones are, which ones are, are, are doing really well, which ones are, are getting uh, you know, all the attention that they need. They're producing the results that it is that you want. And then which ones are more in the challenged field or in the, uh, you know, th this is not working. This, this is actually suffering. And in that distinguishing of like, this is suffering. And the, the way I, I distinguish that is to say, if I don't intervene, it's gonna head toward disastrous or destructive or really hurt me or someone that I'm, I'm in relation with. So for instance, I mean, how many times have we seen people accomplish this great financial or career success, but their health is in the gutter. And if they don't intervene, they, we know where that's going. And I've seen time and time again, so many, especially a lot of the men that I coach, 
where they're successful financially, but their marriage is in the, you know, it's on the rocks. And if they don't intervene in that, then they know, we know where that's going. We know that that's going to become, you know, destructive or it's going to, or, you know, you know, be so tense, it's going to break. And so first we've got to do an honest audit. And then you actually said it, it, it uh, Claude, is that it requires priority. And priority is key to prioritize. If you look at the word priority, prio means first. It means that I mm -hmm. must give my focused attention. I must give that my first attention because our first attention, our focused attention is actually the attention that's most potent. We have, uh, you know, I say it all the time, you know, energy is unlimited, but focused energy is not. So we've got to re uh, determine and distinguish what requires my focused attention right now in this season of my life and then build skills, practices, uh, you know, uh, you know, in, uh, excuse me, foundational approaches to really feeding them on a day-to-day -day or week-to-week -week basis. Mm. Right. Yeah. Well, I just wanted to say, so we love to give our clients and our listeners tips. So you've been stating a lot. You've already embodied a lot. Mm. So three tips that would really work in embodying this. I know you said prioritize, but like when you're working with somebody, what are like the first three that we can give the listeners even that are those steps? Cause it is baby steps or sometimes people leap and jump, mm. but like three basic, I heard you say prioritize, but like, what are those steps stepping in the like first, action steps in the first step, the first domino honesty, like we've got <laughs> to be honest. There's, there's so many of us with, without honesty, we're actually like, completely overriding our reality. No, no, no. My finances are fine. No, my health is good. Like, no, let's be honest about it. Be, and I want like honest. What does your bank account say right now? Not what do you think is coming in, but what does it say right now? Start with honesty. Start with the honesty around your health, honesty around your marriage, honesty around your passions or your spiritual life. Be honest about it. That's always the first domino because honesty opens up space and room for new possibilities. And I just see so many people trying to make changes and adaptations on top of dishonesty. And I, it doesn't work. It won't stick long-term or sustainable. So that's step number one. Number two is prioritize and let that priority come to the surface and only adapt or evolve one small thing at a time. I know people like to take big leaps and, you know, there's the, I don't know, the romantic part of me that, want, you know, wants to walk into work and flip the desk over and say, all right, who's coming with me kind of thing. <laughs> it, 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 we put more stress on ourselves doing it that way than actually taking a deep breath and breaking down our year to months, to weeks, to days, and saying, okay, what today? What's one advancement? Or what can I address today that just moves the needle forward? Even mm -hmm. by an inch, even if it's by an inch, because that over time becomes sustainable. And finally, uh, the third, I would say, is all of these steps first is, it, it starts with, I would say embodiment is the third step. And when I break that down, it's everything starts with a commitment. Then you've got to practice that commitment. That I would call mastery. It requires commitment. It requires consistency. It requires adaptation. It requires evolving. What do I add? What do I strip away? How do I refine what I'm doing until I embody it? It just becomes part of who I am. It becomes part of my foundations becomes part of my habits and my routines, then add something else or subtract something else. Too, too often we try to make giant leaps. We try to jump across the Grand Canyon. I suggest shrink the canyon or people try to take on too many things at once. And if we do that, we cause overwhelm. Overwhelm creates inconsistency and inconsistency creates self-sabotage. So I take a very simplified approach, break it down, 
make it doable and achievable so that it's repeatable. Once it's repeatable and you've embodied it, move on to, okay, great. What's another thing? What's in the next thing? What do I add? What do I subtract? What do I automate? What do I delegate? What do I eliminate? And then we keep moving forward. But the amount of ground that you can cover doing it that way over 30 days, 60 days, 90 days, or one year is astonishing. Yeah. I just want to back up for a moment. That, that was a lot to unpack. Mm. And I, I appreciate, right? It is the steps and it's the consistency, as you call it, the law of repetition. Mm. And when we think about if we choose a domain, and let's just take the example of a couple. And there's a, a space of like, you know, I want to step into career and, you know, partnership is not there yet. Do you, you know, how do you work with someone to say, right, we need to build up this cup to stay, not stabilize, that might not be, mm. but enrich this area so you can launch from. Do you, do you work with your clients to, to do that piece? In that, in that distinguishing and in that honest auditing, what I have my clients highlight is what I call a cornerstone domain. Your cornerstone domain is the one domain that in this season of life impacts and influences everything else to the greater degree. So I said before, there's different seasons to life. In, in this season of life, maybe health is my cornerstone domain. Maybe career or finance is my cornerstone domain. We wanna highlight and prioritize which is the cornerstone domain, meaning which is the one that's going to influence everything else and let's make that one the main priority. Because here's the thing, Right now, if, if finances is my cornerstone domain and I'm trying to give like extra love and attention to traveling and to adventuring and to leisure. And meanwhile, I'm like, uh, hey, how about uh, you barely have enough money to get from A to B right now? Let's make finances the cornerstone domain because it's going to influence everything else. There's other people who, let's say a, you said like even a couple where health is actually the cornerstone domain. And by addressing that, they increase their energy and their energy increases their patience with each other and their patience increases their communication with each other. We've got to highlight what's the cornerstone domain in this season of my life. Then what I do there is I say, great, we're going to handle all of this. However, nature runs on sequence. It runs on recipes. And one of the things I say to my clients all the time is let's kill the alligator closest to the boat first. There's no sense in talking about an alligator that's 50 yards away if there's one crawling into your canoe right now. Let's kill this alligator first. Then let's go to the next alligator. And then we'll address or advance that. And so what we do there is we create a sequence. We create a recipe. All of these things are important but which one needs the most attention right now? Again, that it requires honesty and priority. Thank you. Mm. Yeah, that, that makes sense. So, so cornerstone. Yeah. And I'm hearing there's agreement. It's not about the I, and sometimes it is, and we get to enroll, but it's about a we. I'm really hearing that it gets to be what is ours, and so that, I, that makes the space even for yours. Yes, yeah. yeah. Right. Okay. And, 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 and how do we now support that, encourage that, consider that, especially if we're in relationship. If my cornerstone domain is this over here and your cornerstone domain is this over here, like how do we now interact and relate, prioritize, agree to, uh, you know, give each other and, and those cornerstone domains, how do we give them extra consideration? And then in, in, in uh, you know, especially in couples or marriages, it's a dance. It's a dance of, of, communication of, of priority of language of agreement as uh, a whole whole slew of uh, mm. uh, of dancing that goes on there but it really clarifies what you're saying really clarifies when you look at cornerstones or I don't want to say weaknesses it's but it's the place you need the work the most yeah. it doesn't mean we all don't want to evolve and do work everywhere but when you're clear of each other's cornerstones and you can work that together and, and communicate and but I love on like I think what you said in the beginning, honesty, it's like 
wherever we go from there, if we're not honest. <laughs> I mean, really, where, where am I going? And uh, it's taken me some work, to be honest with my, and it, it's a continual process of like, how can I get more honest? How yeah. can I get more on, like? Audit. audit. You audit, but <laughs> it, if you think of it this way, like if you look at the word honest, it's an old Latin word of un est. Un is one, est is present. So honesty is really me just saying, I'm at one with my present experience. I'm at one with the present moment. And so honesty is always the invitation to be present. And what I love what you said, Mark, like what was honest for me maybe a decade ago or five years ago or last year, like, wow, there's different layers and levels to my honesty. Well, yeah, because it's a new moment. Mm. It's a new moment now. And now, I, okay, what's my experience? What's my state? How do I communicate that? Or how do I even refine my communication of that with myself, with my partner, with my clients or the people I coach or my family or my friends? There's this constant refinement to it that I've found. And that there's a, there's a secret in there. We were talking about consistency and repetition. You cannot refine anything that you're inconsistent at. Mm -hmm. It requires a consistency. It requires a, a daily practice or a, a committed intention to say, like, okay, let me practice honesty. Now let me refine it. What I what I was thinking and what I was experiencing and feeling, I didn't communicate that well. So let me refine that. Let me polish that so that my wife gets it or my clients like in our relationships. Like, all right, let me refine that. Let me adjust that, adapt it, evolve it. And I think it's I think honesty is a ongoing evolution. I don't think you're honest once and all of a sudden, like, now, now, now the life, you know, the Red Sea parts, like, no, I think it's a constant, constant refinement and evolution. Mm. I, and I also find there are people who, you know, draw the line in the sand and they don't have the flexibility to revisit it. Yeah. It becomes their position and it may be grounded um, in a value that once was there, but it may not serve or it doesn't have the, the space to expand and allow for, like you said, a new experience. Yeah. 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 It opens up that space so that mm. I can refine it. I can evolve it. I can deeper embody it. I can, mm -hmm. I can refine my communication so that it gets to the point where, you know, it really creates that space, especially in relationships where we could actually communicate you know in so much of the nonverbal, mm. you know with so much i mean most of our communication is nonverbal. so as we're constantly committed to that refinement of honesty and which breeds integrity which then breeds self-esteem which then breeds confidence these are all bedrocks of of principle and as we you know refine and embody that over and over and over again it really becomes you know, who we are and how we embody. And then most of our communication is done that way. Sure is. So, so I'm really curious that just made me very curious about, so you're working with a client. How do you get them to that? Like you're probably a very good reader of people and you can feel, and you're watching their body language. And how do you get them to that place? So if a client comes to you and they aren't telling the truth or they are like, how do you, how do you get a client to that place? How do you get somebody to be honest, to, to come out and communicate what's really go, You know what I mean? Cause yeah. I think a lot of people going to therapy, I know when I started or different kind of work, a coach or being honest is not easy. That's really vulnerable. Yeah. But how do you even get them to that place? They haven't been honest in their life. They haven't, that hasn't been their practice. They're maybe new to it. I don't know. Um, yeah. So how do you even bring them? We talk about first steps. How do you bring them there? Yeah. even to get there. The, the first thing I think for any coach, oh, I'll speak for myself as a coach because I don't want to speak for therapists or, but as a coach and as a trainer, I think the biggest thing is listening and listening without assumptions. So I always ask my clients what's important to them. And I never want to assume I know. I always want to listen. Like you tell me what's important to you. I could look at someone and be like, this should be important to you, <laughs> but it's clearly not like, ah, that's my judgment. That's my assessment. That's my, 
presupposition. But I actually want to start with the client to say, just tell me what's important to you. What's important in your marriage? What's important in your health and in your finances? <laughs> what's important? What is it that is important to you that maybe, and then maybe you're not producing the result in? Mm-hmm. And then now, t- now that you t- you've told me that this is important to you, mo- a lot of my job is simply to constantly remind them what they told me was important to them. <laughs> and I'm just constantly <laughs> reminding yeah. them of that. Now, what happens is, is the moment someone says, this is important to me, this is what I want, this is what I desire, this is what I don't have that I do want to have in my marriage, in my money, in my relationships, in my health, so be it. Well, the moment they say that, you're now tapping that person into a place of consideration and underneath the place of consideration is care. They're ultimately saying, I care about this. I care about my health. I care about my energy. I care about my children. I care about my marriage and my money. I care about it. Once you have them connected to something that they care about, now we can begin to highlight or even illuminate all right, so you are you're telling me this is important to you and you care about it. What are certain things that you're doing that are leading you closer to that, achieving it mm-hmm. or experiencing it? And what are some things that you're doing that are actually taking you further away from it or even stunting or procrastinating it? Now, all of a sudden, you have them not necessarily logical. You actually have them in a state of feeling or emotion or experience that this matters to me. I care about it. I care about as I get older, I want to have energy to play with my kids. I care about as I get older, I'm able to live the lifestyle or protect my family financially. I care about, I do work that means a lot to me that's purposeful and meaningful. Great. What are you doing now that we, now that we've established that, what are you doing that's bringing you moving the needle closer to it step by step or inch by inch? What are you doing, honestly, that may be getting in the way of that or is hindering it? And when I first started my practice, I first started my my coaching practice over a decade ago, mostly in health and lifestyle. And in the discovery meeting, just, just to see if people wanted to work with me or not, or if we were a good fit, I always used to say, tell me three things that you're doing or uh, for your health excuse me, I used to say, tell me three things that you uh, currently are not doing that you should be doing for your health. (laughs) And everyone had three answers. Everyone knew. They were all very clear about it. But what they were hiring me for was to say, like, I know it. I'm not doing it. I need you to help me fill in the gap. Like, that was it. I mean, it's it's actually that simple, but we've got to get people to a place that where they care. And then Mark, what you're asking is that when I, when I care about something, I'm willing to take that risk of vulnerability. I'm willing to take that risk of transparency. I'm willing to take that risk of saying, you know what, there's, there's some things I'm doing that aren't adding up. They're not moving me closer, or I could even admit they're in my way. But without that person in a state of caring, it's, it's very hard because logically people are like, oh, I'll get to it one day. Don't worry. I've already figured it out and roadmap and spreadsheeted. I'm like, that's not going to work. All right. We got to really get, we got to get people to a place where they care and they're, they have an actual concern. Thank you. That was really clear. Thank you. Yeah, my pleasure. Yeah. That is a conversation of mastery. It is a process. It is. A it, is. Steps. it is. And I, I think that, you know, Mastery is so important and mastery also leaves room for mistake and mess and failure and tripping up and refining, recalibrating, readjusting. Like people think like mastery is just, oh, now I'm the black belt. No, you are not the black belt. That's embodiment. Yeah. And mastery is white belt and blue belt and purple belt and brown belt and then black belt mastery is the commitment of the consistency of the space in between and you know a black belt can't undo their black beltness 
that's to, that to me is embodiment. Mastery is really the process of the consistent commitment that really moves us toward what you embodying, you know, these principles or these ways of being, or these, these, uh, even these, you know, structures and habits and routines that we just, they're just part of who we are now. Mm -hmm. But we always remember mastery, mastery it requires a bit of a mess. And there's that no it does. <laughs> nothing it does. wrong with that at all. No, we get to let go of the looking good conversation. And yeah, you know, no, yeah. That's a, it's part of it's part of our growth. I think yeah. that's like, you know, I think that's the razor's edge of mastery is this commitment that pulls me into the unknown, which calls forth this greater version of who I am and this greater potential and possibility. And at the same time, reconciling that I'm human, I'm going to make mistakes and also be gentle and patient with myself. And I think it's a fine line of, I messed that up and I'm going to keep moving. And I, oh, that did not go the way as planned. How do I readjust and recalibrate? And I think incredibly successful people have a, a unique relationship with that than people that try something once and then give it up. Yes. <laughs> no. As you as you said that, you know, I I also I had the sense of right. It's the it's also the dance of the masculine and feminine energies. And I thought of nature, and mm. you know, I, I've as <laughs> I've known you all your life, <laughs> and you have a, a beautiful dance with nature as a teacher and as a student. Mm. So I was wondering, how does nature for you also fit into fulfillment, and 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 you know, if you could speak into that for us. Well, uh, you know me. I mean, I could talk about nature and and my relationship <laughs> with it, <laughs> you know, for several calls. You know, yes. uh, but the the easiest way, and I think the most digestible way that I could put it, is that there are um, there are laws and rules that govern our lives, and really, there's three. One is our personal law or personal rule. And that's the way I filter the world. That's my unique worldview. That's my paradigm. It's my morals, my ethics, the way that I interact, relate with myself, with people, with the world, with life. Everyone has personal laws. There's things you do, there's things you don't do. And some of us probably need some reflection <laughs> on that. <laughs> but everyone lives by their own personal laws. Mm -hmm. Next law are social laws. Social laws are religious, political, cultural, country. They change state to state. They change country to country. Laws in Nevada are not the same as laws in New Jersey or Florida. Like they're, they're cultural. They're technically cultural agreements. We as human beings have evolved to such a point where we say this is acceptable, this is unacceptable. Cultural laws in the 60s are irrelevant today. We've, we've grown, we've adopted, we've adapted, we've evolved. So there's the second law are actually cultural laws. And there a lot of them are based in politic or religion or just simply you know, social agreements. Now the third law are natural laws. And natural laws do not care whether you believe in them or not. <laughs> <laughs> Hurricanes are an example. They, do not, they don't care. Hurricanes, viruses, gravity, they don't care. They don't care what your personal law is. They don't care what your social law is. They just simply are. Your personal laws, I hope, have evolved from when you were a teenager till now. Social laws have evolved from the 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s to now because we've evolved. Natural laws, they just are. They don't care about your personal belief system. They don't care about your social belief system. What I've found for me in my life is that when I try to enforce my personal laws or even social laws on natural laws, I suffer or we suffer. But I have also found that when I tap into natural laws and I govern my life accordingly, my life thrives. And there's, there's simple natural laws, like laws of integrity, laws of, we were talking about laws of repetition, laws of sequencing, 
laws of momentum, laws of mastery. When I tap into those and I use those natural laws, my life thrives. Because nature knows better than me. Mm -hmm. I'm humble enough to admit that. And I'm also humble enough to repeat that humility. And so for me, the physical world of nature and the more and more time I spend in it, I find that it recalibrates me and it slows me down and it helps me recognize all of this technology and all of this personal law that I try to govern my life by and enforce and whatever. Nature's like, yeah, yeah, yeah get out of here with that. <laughs> yeah, you, you, you thought all that was, and now I'm just going to throw, you're in the middle of the Rocky Mountains with you know no cell phone, and I'm going to throw this storm at you, and you're just going to persevere. Mm -hmm. And to me, I've just found that nature has a way of naturally recalibrating my priority, what I think is important, what I think is pressing, uh, this speed, pace. Mm -hmm. Nature has a way of recalibrating all that, especially in what I've I've found found and am finding that we're speeding up. I think in our speeding up, there's a, there's a brilliance to technology, but technology without humanity or technology without sustainability is just us running faster off of a cliff. And so I think we, we have to slow down and really tap into you know, that natural calibration of, or are we using this technology to improve ourselves, our lives, our state, our you know, culture, our, our earth, our planet, or are we using this at an unsustainable pace that uh, we're just kind of dumping our uh, unsustainability off on the future? So for me, the, um, the natural laws and, and governing my life by that, I think I've always found that when I do that, my, my life thrives. And, I, and the, you know, one of the last things I'll say on that, uh, on nature, is the amount of recalibration I get from and the reminder that I get from uh, of interconnectedness mm -hmm. but there's nothing in nature that is just this like monocrop mm -hmm. or you know this uh <laughs> just one thing and oh there you go and you know there's such diversity and biodiversity and ecosystem and interconnectedness and dependency upon this from this and that from that and in order for everything to thrive, there has to be that interconnectedness that's actually strengthened rather than, rather than, uh, you know, dividing. Mm -hmm. And I always, I don't know who said it, maybe the Dalai Lama or someone said like, you know, the flowers don't live on their own pollen. The sun doesn't live on its own light. You know, birds don't you know feed on uh, don't feed on themselves. Like everything is interconnected and dependent upon each other. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think nature gives me a great reminder of that interconnectedness, that harmony that's possible, uh, and that balance that's that I think we we really need to start to prioritize uh, in a, culturally. Yeah, I mean, I think we've all witnessed in our short lives and consistent, you know, is when man's laws and societal laws are in conflict, yes. right? We have deforestation, if you believe or not, climate change, yeah. uh, you know, Antarctica, there, there's things that are melting. It's a natural occurrence, but we have also accelerated by our own wills and controls yeah. in, in those places. Yeah, Thank yeah you. there's um, there's one of my, well, you know that one of my favorite books uh is the Tao Te Ching and uh I'm that's on verse five <laughs> it, it, I, I'm really I'm taking the time to really good be good. with it yes yeah good we, we, I've been reading it for decades so don't yeah. worry there's no there's no rush mm -hmm. but there's um one of my favorite what you just said there's a uh, one of my favorite quotes or stanzas in the Tao is, is chapter 39 that says when when man is in harmony with the Tao, the sky is clear and spacious and all creatures flourish together and they're content with the way things are, constantly renewed, constant re constantly replenished. Mm -hmm. But when man interferes with the Tao, the sky becomes filthy, earth becomes depleted, the equilibrium crumbles and, and creatures go extinct. Mm -hmm. 
And you're talking about something written 2,500 years ago, <laughs> you know, and it's as relevant today, mm-hmm. probably more relevant today than 2,500 years ago, but it really has us, you know, really examine that deep connection of, are we in harmony or are we, you know, out of completely out of balance? Yeah, no, that's a gr- beautiful reminder. Mm. And I'm, I'm just curious for you, how, or maybe you can share with us, the, the balancing of using nature and rituals together, mm. what that brings forth, what, what is that opening that, that, uh, that creates? The, um, what I would say is the, the, the natural rituals or old ancestral rituals I think they tap into a simplicity and a primal nature that is within human being that I don't think is ever going to get covered or suppressed by technology and convenience. And I think for me, like a huge part of my life, especially Native American rituals, sweat lodges, Chinupa ceremonies, tobacco ceremonies, you know, that I've been using as you know, mechanisms and vehicles since I was young have become a a major grounding force in me or in my life. And I think for me, there's this, there's something about the simplicity of, you know, a thatched hut with blankets on top, a fire pit that's heating rocks and you're pouring water on them. And then you are just sweating beyond sweating. But if you think about the simplicity of that, I think there's something really wise in it. The other portion that I can say is, this is these are also sacred ceremonies that have survived through genocide. And we have this, a, a culture that went through genocide in, here in our country. And yet these rituals and these ceremonies are so sacred that they were preserved through that. And so I always, whenever I'm in those ceremonies, I always take a moment to reconnect with what people had to go through just so that I could be sitting here, standing in front of this fire in this ceremony to to work on my own growth and my own evolution. And it's not lost on me. And I always ask people that I'm participating with, like, let, let's have that not be lost on us that, w- you know, what has had to happen and what people have gone through for us to be sitting here, mm-hmm. we couldn't even comprehend and fathom it. And so for me, those have always been so important in my life because they really help me recalibrate what's important and, and priority. Mm-hmm. And I, you know, in every prayer in those things, I'm reminded of like, wow, that is, that's just non-essential and superfluous what I'm worrying about. <laughs> uh, and, oh, yeah. yeah. And it, when you're, when you're just trying to breathe and the only relief you're getting is the cool ground that's always there for you. You're like, yeah, I, I'm, I'm definitely making more out of <laughs> what, what is unnecessary and, <laughs> and uh, non-essential. So those ceremonies for me, have been so critical and so important. And I don't know how well your listeners know our connections, but obviously we're cousins. But Mark, when I was young, a major catalyst was when you were off doing, you know, survival courses and things like that. And when you came back from when you came to our house and I was 14 and you showed me how to make fire without matches, you had just learned it. You had done a bow drill and blew this coal that you worked hard to produce and you put it in a tinder bundle and blew it into a flame. And when you did that, it it tapped into something primitive in me. And I remember thinking like, wow, this is special. And that was a huge catalyst for me to to be able to reproduce it, learn about it. Mm -hmm. And really like, it, it became what I call a river changer in life, like the course of your life is going down the river this way and all of a sudden it just changes, it shifts. And that to me, like seeing that happen really tapped into something to me of, that was so primal and so ancestral, but every time I tap into it, it feels like home. 
You have a beautiful way of putting all of it. I, um, as you're speaking, I, I realize, and it comes down to honesty again, like you're looking at nature and nature's honest. It's clean. It's not yeah. manipulating. It's not, you know, we're manipulating. We, we manipulate our honesty. We manipulate what we're doing to the earth, what we're doing yeah. in life. And nature's just clean. And those ceremonies, like, you know, we've done sweat lodges together. We've both done them on our own. Yeah. Um, is the line, omatakuyeso, with all our relations? Or I thought of that when you thought of all the ancestry yeah. that has come here, yeah. that has made this possible. Yeah. Before we enter the lodge, we say, aho metakuyasa, to all my ancestors, all my relations. And because we're honoring all of the history and the people and the, th that have brought us to where we are. And it's a, it's a way of looking back and, and giving thanks and giving praise and giving respect to what people have had to endure to get to where we are now. And I think, I love that you put nature is clean. You know, justice is our creation. Nature just is. And we could say it's unjust and we could say it's just, but it just is. And I think the, the more aligned we keep our honest reality with nature i think it again it opens up possibilities and i think it's going to open up possibilities that we're not yet seeing around sustainability around honoring the planet and each other and having enough resource and there's a whole new possibility we're just not seeing yet yeah. because there is i think once we're honest we'll we'll really start to shift into a new possibility because the, the, uh, it'll forever i mean hopefully not forever, but it will always baffle me that we can look at the earth, something, we could look at something so beautiful and yet treat it so badly. And I think this is going to require honesty for us to actually stop and pause and reflect. What are we actually doing uh, here in our relationship with, with each other, with the planet, with our resources, with sustainability, with our future? Mm. And I think that's going to, again, it's going to require honesty. And then from that honesty, we could repair and we could adapt and we could evolve. But I think, you know, if we break that down into a micro level, that's what so many people are, are really looking now to do and evolve their own personal life. And that's why they hire me or seek guidance or coach or therapist, a trainer or something. Because we come to that honest reflection of there's something I'm doing that's not working. Mm -hmm. And that requires courage and honesty and, and, and awareness and reflection. Sure does. Is there some um, habits or uh, routines that you can recommend to our, our audience to live their life authentically? I think I'm a big fan of having a presence practice, whatever that is for someone, meditation, time outside in nature, you know, non-distractive time. <laughs> right? Deliberately non-distractive time. You know, so I spend an hour outside every day with no phone and no distractions just to, I love, you know, gardening and, and landscaping and things like that. Like, I just love it. It, it Again, it recalibrates me. A presence practice, uh, meditation. I also, I was saying before, I'm a, a, you know, a big proponent of, you know, one thing at a time, advance one thing at a time. Again, the Tao is so overused of the journey of a thousand miles begins with a single step. Like it's become cliche, but we really, I think authenticity really embodies that. Mm -hmm. And so I'm a big proponent, like learn one new thing every day, small, whether it's a quote, whether it's a, you know, a chapter in a book, like just learn, you continue to compound one small thing every day and keep compounding on that and, and use the law of repetition to keep growing. And, uh, the other is, you know, uh, again, honest audits of our honesty. And what I, what I mean by that is start to highlight, Mark was saying it before, you start to highlight, where am I fabricating? Where am I embellishing? Where am I inflating things and knock it off? Or where am I omitting things and leaving things out and sugarcoating things? And start to knock that off too. You know, I, I think in the end, we will appreciate and respect our clarity and directness when it's tempered with patience and sensitivity. 
I think we'll appreciate that more than, you know, telling each other and ourselves pretty little lies week after week and year after year and decade after decade, because that just digs more and more holes. So access to, you know, directness with yourself and be, and, and really do an honest audit of your honesty. I, I'm sorry. How do you feel like um, feedback goes into there too? I mean, is that something, I mean, I get it's an internal piece yeah. and there are times I, I mean, we have blind spots. Yeah. Don't see yeah. how we show up. Um, in areas. I, ab absolutely. The, I, the I, feedback is a huge part of that. However, uh, never solicit feedback from spectators. Mm -hmm. Only solicit feedback from people that are in the arena willing to bleed and sweat with you. Oh, Brene Brown. Oh. Love that. Love that quote. Never. Yep. You, 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 it's a, it you're not qualified so, if you're not in the arena. It's so key. And I think right now people are over esteeming feedback from spectators and trolls and online, this and that. And I'm like, and they're underestimating and undervaluing people that are actually in their lives that have accomplished what they want to have, you know, want to have accomplished and are there to support you and what you're accomplishing. And we undervalue it. And I think we overvalue the spectators and we undervalue the people that are actually in the arena. And I think feedback is key, but you've got to be very selective uh, with who you get your feedback from. And I, I always just say, you know, find people that have accomplished what you want to accomplish in a particular domain. So if you want to accomplish something in your marriage and you see someone that has accomplished it, find them and ask them, what are they doing that's different than what you're doing? Yeah. And then go do that. Yeah. And then find someone that has you created something abundant or prosperous in their finances and ask them, what are you doing differently than I'm doing? And then go do that. Mm -hmm. And because it, it shortens the trial period of messing up. <laughs> it just shortens it. I'm like, guys, th this is so incredibly valuable. Like you, you let's shorten the ride. Yep. Yeah. Which, the pain, I guess you could say. Yeah. And it's so key that we you know, find people that have accomplished what you want and then identify what are they doing differently than you are and then go repeat it and you know, match it and mirror it mm -hmm. and don't overcomplicate it. Mm -hmm. And if you have their respect, ask them for feedback. Thank you. Thanks. Thank, yeah, that was great. Um, it makes me think, uh, our, my experience of growing up we were a very image-oriented family. And so we were always, oh, you're doing, is that Maggie? That's Mabel. 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 Yeah. Um, hey, Mabel. Um, that we were always looking for spectators outside. Always that image is always going outside and not looking inside or getting feedback from places that were what I wanted to accomplish. I was always looking outside. It's been a lot of work to come back to not the outside image. You are saying social media, not the image. I want to go to people that are, embodying it are honest authentic they're sharing the journey they're in the journey they they've accomplished what you want they you know uh, very important and, and I, I think too is exactly what you're saying we off, often think like those are so like far away from us like there's some six degrees of separation like you've got to go find tony robbins or something and you're like no there's probably people in your stratosphere that if you actually break it down to a simple level, maybe this one has accomplished this and this one has accomplished that and this one has accomplished that. And then all of a sudden you actually start to strengthen your orbit. Mm -hmm. I, I can guarantee that if they're not in your sphere now, number one, that's good feedback that you sh they should be in your, your sphere and orbit. And if they're not, I can guarantee you they're probably in your second circle. That there's someone you know that could put you in touch with someone that's accomplished something you've wanted to accomplish. Sure. I can yeah. guarantee it. It's not six degrees. It's really two at most. Mm -hmm. And I think when you, when we shift that focus or priority and attention from the image to our character, then we actually start to re uh, calibrate and reevaluate, you know, where it is our intention that we're actually coming from. Mm -hmm. uh, Thank you. I want to just go back. You had said nature. You go out in nature for an hour. And we do a challenge with our listeners. We always want to give them a challenge and, and you know, interactive with us because they can post it on Instagram, Facebook, you know, the BTO podcast. So I want to challenge our listeners to spend an hour in nature. Turn off the phone. 
Go out there, experience it. If you want to work with your hands, if you want to sit in silence. You know, I always say to people, even hiking, I've learned that even when you hike through nature, nature goes away. But if you go and sit for hours, I've sat for 10, 12 hours, nature comes out. You see things, the spider making the web, the animals moving around. So spend an hour. That's our challenge. And you can post it and tell us your feedback and what you've uh, seen when you do that. So spend that hour, like Michael was saying, spend that hour in nature and just no phone, no nothing, and just be with it and see yeah. what comes. And yeah. maybe, maybe that. make I that love, a ritual. <laughs> yeah, I love that. I love that you, you nature you know, comes out. It comes alive. Mm -hmm. Yes. And if you'd like to take a picture or tell us your experience, uh, you can do so at the BTO Podcast on Instagram, LinkedIn, Twitter, Facebook. Uh, tag us and let us know what, what came out of it for you. Thank you. There's the last section, Mike, Michael, that we'd like to invite you in. And this is uh, Fast Fire Questions. So it mm. uh, comes off, you know, your mind in a sentence. Um, and Mark and I will take turns. So my first one to you is complete the sentence. God means to you is, or God means to me is. God means to me life, joy, truth. Thank you. Um, so I'll ask you, uh, what makes you the most v vulnerable in your life and how do you deal with that? Vulnerable as a place of connected to my emotion or vulnerable as a place of like transparent. How about both? <laughs> That's, those are uh, strong. <laughs> connect, connected to emotion, I would say what makes me the most vulnerable? Oh, wow. That's a great question. I would say reflection on my time and experiences with the people that matter most with me. And transparent, I would say, um, hmm, it, looking, looking forward and really being honest and confronting my inadequacies to move me to my next phase or level. Thank you. Thank you for that. Mm -hmm. What are your daily habits that have you show up as effectively as you do? Uh, daily habits. The first thing I do every morning is I wake up and I, my wife puts her head on my chest and I say, thank you. That's how I start every day. And uh, that won't go away anytime soon. <laughs> then uh, then I, I read from the Tao every day. I spend time outside every day. I learn something new every day. I call my mom every day or I, call, I, I make sure every day I connect with someone I care about, whether it's a text or a phone call or whatever. I always, you know, I, I make that a priority. Because uh, our, our, my life is, you know, busy. I'm, I'm, I know most people's are, mm -hmm. but I, I prioritize uh, connection with friends and family. Mm -hmm. And then uh, I also, I, I move my body every day. I exercise or, or, or uh, train every day. And then also I'm, I'm very deliberate about food. Uh, food's a big part of my life. And so I love to cook. I love to feed people. So I, I have a very high standard of what I eat. Uh, you know, so that, that's also a big part of my, my rituals. And we usually light something every day, sage or a candle or something. And I love the ritual of that because it, it makes the moment distinct. Mm -hmm. I'm lighting this. I'm separating this moment from the moment before it. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So what would you like your legacy to be? That's another great question. <laughs> um, I would like my legacy to be an impact of inspiring people into a new possibility of harmony and sustainability and humility. That's, that's ultimately uh, what I, would, I look forward to having my, uh, my legacy be, is an is a impact to leave that dent on infinity because I lived and have that inspire people into new possibilities. Uh, and, uh, and, and, and also too is to remind people that 
what they desire they deserve. And uh, that fulfillment is not only possible, but it's our birthright. Amen. So, Michael, um, is there some words of wisdom, golden nugget, you'd like our listeners to have as a gift, additional gift that you want to sum up for us? Oh, uh, <laughs> great one. Another great one. I, 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 the, lately, what has been coming for me uh, is, especially in the, 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 the Find Your Tribe course that I run and, and the brotherhood that we create, Lately, I think what's been impactful is to remind people that on our own, we think that our gifts and our skill sets are common and that our challenges are unique. But when we connect and we come together in a sense of brotherhood and sisterhood and a sense of belonging, what we realize is that our challenges are common and that our gifts and our skill sets are incredibly unique. Yeah. Oh, that's a that's a beautiful <laughs> gift. Thank you. Yes, um, most welcome. So I know that they can contact you on www.michaeldesanti.com. Is there any other ways or any other offerings that you'd like people to know that you're? you uh, I heard you speak about coaching. Uh, there's yes, other things yeah. that you'd like them to know that you offer. Provide. You could you could find me on michaeldesanti.com. All my offerings are on there, whether it's personal coaching, whether it's Find Your Tribe, which is a group for men. You could also find me, uh, my retreat company is called thevitalguide.com. We bring uh, growth-minded people on adventures in Montana every summer. And then also uh, soon, uh, I will be offering a, a downloadable course called The Alchemy of Confidence. And that is a, similar to what we were talking about before is tapping into natural laws to really harness and cultivate confidence in your life and bring your life to the next level of potential and possibility. Mm. So those are, you could find all those on michaeldesanti.com and thevitalguide.com. And my book, New Man Emerging, is on Amazon. You can find it anywhere. So right book. here, this is it. It's great. Yeah, Get great it. Book. It's amazing. Yep. Simple, easy. Yeah. Great tools, great, uh, yes. great everything. Yes. From appreciate a great man, it. I have to say, your legacy uh, already is. Oh, I appreciate you know, that. And I love you. Give my love to Ali. And uh, you all bet. That. Yeah, you got it. <laughs> yeah, as you go, you I believe it. you're heading out, right? Um, so I, I want to thank you for your yeah. time as you get ready to head out and do the thing you love to do in nature, yeah, right? right? You get to go to Montana for the next few weeks. Um, yeah. Wish, wish you much health and and. Uh, connection and i appreciate the ecology that you create when you're there with nature uh, thank yeah. you yes. i appreciate you both and i'm i'm proud of you for <laughs> you know jumping into this endeavor and 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 learning and growing and mastering it and yep. eventually embodying it till this is this is who you guys are and love you both love spending time with you and i appreciate you more than you, I, I could even say same here Michael. same here, same here. Right. Yep. love thank you. you thank All you right. for being a guest on the pto podcast and, thank you. and uh, that is our episode for today. And I oh, want right. to thank you, everybody, um, for listening. And we're just going to do a little saying goodbye. <laughs> and thank you for listening to Beyond the Ordinary Podcast. We hope you enjoyed this episode and our deep dive into Michael DeSanti's wisdom and tools for living an effective life, an extraordinary life. If you'd like to help support the podcast, please share it with others. Post about it on social media. Leave us a rating and a review. To catch the ladies from us, follow us on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and LinkedIn at the BTO Podcast. Thanks again, and we'll see you next time.